this brings us to hypersensitivity reactions. The test makers would love to test you on these concepts because these are heavily clinically oriented. For that reason, the test makers love these concepts and also you're more likely to see patients with different types of hypersensitivities during your medical practice. There are four types of hypersensitivity reactions. We know them by the acronym of ACID, anaphylaxis, cytotoxic kind, immune complex type, and delayed type hypersensitivity. What are the commonly used definitions of hypersensitivity? Hypersensitivity is defined and described in different ways, and it's a good idea for us to get a feel for various definitions or descriptions for hypersensitivity. Exaggerated and inappropriate adaptive, adaptive, not innate, adaptive immune response to pathogens that leads to tissue damage. Immune response to harmless exogenous substances such as pollen. Immunopathology. Self-antigens that act as autoantigens and evoke immune response. For instance, DNA is systemic locus. And finally, immune response to pathogens that cannot be cleared by the body over time. Example is tuberculosis. Let's look at the main features of the four types of hypersensitivity reactions. Type 1 is also known as immediate type. The major mediator of this hypersensitivity is IgE. Examples are allergic rhinitis, food allergy, asthma, atopic eczema, and anaphylaxis. Type 2 is also known as cytotoxic type. The major mediators, the immunoglobulins, are IgG and IgM. Examples, hemolytic reactions, good pastures disease, and hyperacute graft rejection. Type 3, immune complex disease or immune complex hypersensitivity. Mediator is mainly IgG. Examples, serum sickness hypersensitivity pneumonitis, systemic lupus, and polyarthritis nodosa. Finally, we get to delayed type. Letter D, the fourth letter of the alphabet, goes with delayed, and also the highest number from 1, 2, 3, 4, number 4 comes later, is delayed. In contrast to the other three, the mediators of the delayed type are T cells. Examples are PPD reaction, purified protein derivative reaction of TB, contact dermatitis, hypersensitivity to nickel, poison IV hypersensitivity, and chronic graft rejection. Chronic goes with delayed, and you can contrast this with hyperacute graft rejection, which is classified as a subtype of type 2, cytotoxic sort of hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity reactions are classified in 1963 by the British immunologist Robin Coombs. Which of the four reactions are antibody mediated and which one is cell mediated? I just mentioned that to you. Three of them are antibody-mediated, type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 4 is cell-mediated. Number 4 goes with the cell that has four letters, C-E-L-L. -L. Which of the four hypersensitivity reactions is evoked by the innate system? Actually, the answer is none. These reactions are mediated by the adaptive system and B and T cells. Is it possible to have hypersensitivity reactions in non-sensitized 
individuals? The answer is no. You need prior sensitization. These reactions occur in sensitized individuals. These individuals must have a minimum of one prior exposure to the same antigen and or haptin for establishing sensitization. It is shown that in the absence of re-exposure to the same haptin, people may still mount hypersensitivity reaction for up to 15 years. Reaction to penicillins by sensitized individuals is considered to be a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. It results from reaction to penicilloic acid that serves as a haptin. Therefore, our question is, what is a haptin after all? Haptin is a chemical moiety that is too small to evoke a T-cell response alone. However, when added to self-proteins, it may create an antigenic effect. As a mnemonic, haptin is half ben. Let's look at the allergic type of reactions. In the list, I have asthma, hay fever, atopic dermatitis, food allergy, and systemic anaphylaxis. The major findings of asthma are dyspnea and coughing. As a mnemonic, asthma, letter A of the asthma goes with the number one, with type one hypersensitivity, and A is the first letter of the alphabet. Hay fever, associated with the symptoms of rhinitis and coryza, you can pronounce it A fever to remind you that this is a type 1, type A hypersensitivity. Atopic dermatitis present with hives, urticaria, and pruritus. Just to know, the A of the atopic reminds you of the type 1 hypersensitivity. Food allergy associated with abdominal discomfort, and again, A of the allergy goes with the type 1 hypersensitivity. Finally, systemic anaphylaxis, dyspnea, and shock, and again, A of the anaphylaxis goes with the type 1 or goes with the allergy. Let's look at the pathophysiology of hypersensitivity type 1. I'm going to refer to this diagram as we go on. Allergens. In this particular case, I'm showing peanuts are phagocytized by the antigen-presenting cells, such as macrophages or dendritic cells. The APC cells then present the fragments of the processed antigens via MHC2. On their surface, two T-cell receptors of naive B-cells in the peripheral lymph nodes. Meanwhile, CD8081 which we already said is known as B7, protein on the APC links to CD28 receptors on the T cells. The APC now gets activated and releases cytokines such as interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin-6 onto the naive T cell. Naive T cells now get activated and they turn into T helper 2 cells and they link with B cells via CD40 receptors and CD40 ligand and they release interleukin 13 and interleukin 4 onto the B cells. Activated B cells can now turn into memory B cells and they perform isotype switching and make IgE. Many of them may become plasma cells and will reside in the tissues and have the ability to produce high amounts of IgE against the original allergen. The mast cells in tissues and basophils in the blood have high affinity IgE receptors on their surfaces. These receptors firmly and rapidly 
attract and hold onto almost all the IgE molecules that are produced by the plasma cells. As such, the free serum IgE levels in humans is minimal. These cells act as the reservoirs of IgE in the body and in the tissues. During the next exposure to the original antigen, cross-linking of the IgE receptors on the muscles causes a widespread release of their vasoactive amines resulting in allergic reaction. Let's look more closely at the allergic reaction and how the mast cells or basophils release their vasoactive amines into their surroundings. This diagram shows how the mast cells and basophils that are surrounded and loaded with IgE after second exposure to the same allergen, in this case I'm showing the peanuts, after cross-linking happens during the second exposure, they release the so-called mnemonic wise HELP! So HELP, as you see, stands for histamine ECF alpha, which stands for eosinophil chemotactic factor, leukotriens, which are also known as SRSA. What does that stand for? Stands for slow release substance of anaphylaxis and finally p stands for prostaglandins you put the first letter together the patient calls for help and the symptoms of help substances or vasoactive amines starts from rash and they may extend into serious anaphylactic shock that is associated with vasodilation hypotension and bronchiolar spasm. So what is the most common type of hypersensitivity? This is type 1. What is the effect of vasoactive amines? Smooth muscle constriction that causes bronchial spasm. Opening of endothelial tight junctions and increasing vascular permeability. This causes edema formation. What are the four main types of shock? It's a good time for us to talk very quickly about the types of shock because these are high yield concepts and quite often the students have problems with understanding them. The four major types are cardiogenic, hypovolemic, obstructive, and distributive. Of course, some textbooks, they divide the shock into six or seven subtypes, but for the sake of your exam, these are the four major types of shock. Let us compare and contrast the four major subtypes of shock, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, distributive, and obstructive. The arrows that I show in red are the major or the primary association or primary issue in these types of shocks and I'm going to be looking at three important parameters and we like to compare and contrast them with each other one is PCWP that stands for pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and in pathophysiology PCWP is an index for the left heart function of course I could have also shown another column for CVP, which is central vein pressure, this one is an index for a right heart function. So if you have right heart failure, CVP increases. If you have a left heart failure, PCWP increases. However, both of these go in the same direction. So in this chart, I'm just showing the PCWP. If you want to add CVP to that column, that will equally work well because PCWP and CVP, they go in the same directions in these types of shocks. So in hypovolemic, PCWP is low because there is less blood to come back to the heart practically. 
And as a result, cardiac output goes down. Cardiac output goes down, now the adrenergic system gets activated. Adrenergic system gets activated, and norepinephrine is going to be released on the alpha-1 receptors on the peripheral vessels, and that increases systemic vascular resistance. Hypovolemic shock is due to fluid or blood loss. It may be due to dehydration or vomiting. Treatment includes IV fluids and oxygenation. For the cardiogenic shock, the problem is the pumping ability of the heart, and as a result, the cardiac output goes down in response to low cardiac output, and as a result of adrenergic output that is increased in response to low cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance goes up because of, again, norepinephrine acting on the alpha-1 receptors, and as a result of low ability of the left heart to pump the blood out, therefore blood backs up in the left atrium, and as a result, PCWP also increases. Major causes of cardiogenic shock include congestive heart failure and valvular defects. Treatment includes oxygenation, use of diuretics, and use of positive ionotropes. Then we get to distributive shock. Actually, it was because of this shock that I ended up talking about different types of shocks. Because if they ask you on the exam, which type of shock is associated with anaphylaxis, you're going to say distributive. In distributive shock, the major issue is vasodilation and leaky vessels. And as a result of this, the systemic vascular resistance goes down. Systemic vascular resistance goes down, less blood comes back to the heart. And as a result, PCWP goes down. PCWP goes down, adrenergic system is going to get activated, and we're going to increase the cardiac output. Cardiac output is increased in these patients or in this condition to compensate reflexively for low SVR. In obstructive shock, there is impediment to blood flow through the heart. A good example is obstructive cardiomyopathy, whereby we have an obstruction to the filling of the heart. Just to know, the obstructive also may refer to ventilation obstruction. For instance, when we have pulmonary embolism, so that may be included under the umbrella of the obstructive shock. In obstructive shock, the cardiac output is low. In response to that, the systemic vascular resistance goes up. As a result of low cardiac output, blood can back up again in the left atrium, and that raises the PCWP. Three good examples of Obstructive shock are thromboembolism, pericarditis, and tamponade. A good note to bear in mind clinically is this. You need to always consider cardiac tamponade when central vein pressure is high and blood pressure is low. Allergic reactions in addition to mast cells and IgE participation also recruit eosinophils to the affected tissues. What is the immunological mechanism of allergic eosinophilia? I will be referring to this diagram to explain this for you. Mast cells, in addition to monoamines and leukotrienes, also produce interleukins. The top two important interleukins produced by the mast cells are interleukin-3 and 5. Interleukin-3 is a growth factor for hemopoietic cells. It has a similar function as granulocyte, macrophage, colony, stimulating factor, GM-CSF. Of course, among the granulocytes, we also have eosinophils. So eosinophils are granulocytes. So interleukin-3 also induces and stimulates formation of the eosinophils in the bone marrow. 
interleukin-5 promotes growth and activation of eosinophils and additionally induces B cells class switch and IgA production. Note that the granulated mast cells also produce eosinophil chemotaxis factors, the so-called eotaxins, that attract eosinophils to the inflammation site. Also note that eosinophils have receptors for secretory IgA, for IgG, and IgE on their surfaces. Eosinophils are also involved in defense against parasitic and helminthic diseases. Additionally, they produce several types of granules, including eosinophilic cationic proteins, eosinophil derived neurotoxins, histaminases, and peroxidases. As you can tell, helminthic worms are too big for eosinophils to phagocytize. Therefore, the question that you're going to be asking is that, what is the anti-helminthic mechanism of action of eosinophils? After IgE coats the parasites, the FC receptor, FCERI, of the eosinophils will recognize IgE. Subsequently, interaction between FCERI an FC portion of helminth bound IgE signals the eosinophils to degranulate. Widespread coverage of the helminthic outer coats by eosinophils and release of their granules damages the skin of the worms, blisters, if you wish, the skin of the worms, and their neurotaxins now enter into the worm and paralyze the worms. Furthermore, eosinophils also have IgA receptors. Presence of this induces mucosal release of secretory IgA. IgA molecules then increase intestinal motility and promote elimination of the paralyzed worms. So what is the term that best describes the collaborative effects of IgE, IgA, and eosinophils in the helminthic immunology. Antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. This is a cell-mediated immune defense whereby an effector cell, such as an NK cell or eosinophil, actively lyses a target cell whose membrane surface antigens have been bound by specific antibodies. In this particular case, we're going to be talking about IgE for the helminthic conditions. You might have heard of atopic individuals or atopic dermatitis. What does the term atopic signify? It signifies genetic tendency to produce IgE. Most individuals with atopic dermatitis, such as eczema, have a personal or family history of other allergies, such as hay fever or allergic rhinitis. The immune system in most individuals maintains a healthy balance between T helper cells, such as T helper 1 cells or T helper 2 cells or T helper 17 cells. The most agreed upon explanation for pathogenesis of atopy points to an imbalance among the T cells that preferentially allow the TH2 cells to become the predominant cells. These cells in turn release interleukin 4, interleukin 5, and interleukin 13, that collectively these interleukins promote IgE production from plasma cells. Of course, the most important one, as I said earlier, is interleukin-5. Anaphylaxis is due to immune response to systemic circulation of the allergens and may potentially be life-threatening. What is 
the pathogenesis of anaphylaxis. Cross-linking of IgE antibodies on mast cells in perivasculatures causes widespread release of their contents. There is a widespread release of histamine and other mast cell derivatives such as prostaglandins into the prevasculatures and the bloodstream. Histamine causes vasodilation and increases vascular permeability. It increases the heart rate and heart contractility. Prostaglandin D2 and leukotrienes, they cause bronchoconstriction. Note that symptoms of prophylaxis may evolve rapidly and will become life-threatening in a very short time. Patients with anaphylaxis present with severe hypotension and increased cardiac output. What is the descriptive term for these findings? Hypotension and increased cardiac output. High output shock. So let's just look at the list of the major medications for type 1 hypersensitivity. We use glucocorticosteroids, chromoline sodium, antihistamines, and epinephrine. Glucocorticosteroids stabilize mast cells and basophil membranes, and as a result, they prevent degranulation of these cells. Chromoline sodium is used for management of asthma, prevents mast cell and basophil degranulation. But make sure to know that you are not supposed to use chromoline sodium for therapy once the type 1 reaction is in progress. Antihistamines that you can use them IV or IM compete with histamine for receptors on the target cells. Finally, IM injection of epinephrine, which is drug of choice for severe type 1 reactions. When epinephrine vasoconstricts, and of course this is desirable if you have relaxation of the vessels that happens with the type 1 anaphylaxis. So when epinephrine vasoconstricts, it's acting as what kind of adrenergic drug? It's acting as alpha-1 agonist, and that causes vasoconstriction. When epinephrine relaxes smooth muscles, and this is desirable in anaphylaxis because the patients have bronchoconstriction. So in this condition, it is acting as what kind of adrenergic drug? This time, it acts as a beta-2 agonist, and beta-2 agonists, they cause bronchodilation. Is asthma considered an obstructive or restrictive pulmonary disease? Asthma is obstructive condition. In asthma, would long function studies show an FEV1 over FVC? This index is known as Tefanu index. Forced expiratory volume in one second over forced vital capacity. It shows this index to be more or less than 80% or 0.80. Less than 0.80. What is wheel and flare skin test? This is a skin testing for allergic sensitization. It includes one of the two, either a skin puncture or intradermal application of the specific allergens that we like to study. With this test, the reaction in sensitized individuals is demonstrable within 15 minutes. The wheel is a raised and blanched bump, whereas flare is the red surrounding on the affected area. Of course, the larger the wheel and flare, the greater the sensitivity. After taking amoxicillin for a strep sore throat, a five-year-old child is rushed to the emergency room with a wide spectrum of symptoms, including wheezing respiratory sounds, difficulty in breathing, abdominal pain and cramps, vomiting and diarrhea. Initial examination reveals tachycardia, tachypnea, 
and extremely low blood pressure. Further examination reveals widespread swellings, especially on the lips, mouth, throat, eyelids, genitals, and hands and feet. She had marked eruptions on her skin that were characterized by wheels with pale interiors and well-defined red margins. Let us have this case scenario in the background for now. My first question, what is the term that correctly describes findings of swellings on the lip, mouth, throat, eyelids, genitals, and hands and feet, and widespread skin eruptions characterized by wheels with pale interiors and well-defined red margins. The term is angioedema. So what is the difference between urticaria and angioedema? And of course, these two terms, as you can tell, are quite often used interchangeably, or there are a lot of similarities between these two sort of conditions. Angioedema is characterized by rapid edema of the dermal, subdermal, mucosal, and submucosal tissues. It's very similar to urticaria or hives and occurs in the upper dermis. In other words, urticaria is more superficial. Rapidly developing cases of angioedema are medical emergencies because of the potential for airway obstruction and suffocation. So what substance plays an important role in etiology of angioedema? Bradykinin, which is a potent vasodilator and increases vascular permeability that leads to rapid accumulation of fluids in the interstitium. Why are the most dreaded symptoms of angioedema most obvious on the face? The face has less supporting connective tissues. What are the two major mechanisms for induction of angioedema? Use of ACE inhibitors that block ACE enzyme, which normally degrades bradykinin. In the so-called condition of hereditary angioedema, bradykinin formation is caused by continuous activation of the complement system due to a deficiency of C1 estrays, and this results in continuous activation of the complement system and continuous production of Kali crane. What is the suggested therapy for this patient? Subcute injection of epinephrine as well as IV diphenhydramine plus methylprednisolone. So you give epinephrine, you give antihistaminic medications, diphenhydramine, and you give also a glucocorticosteroid. C1 esterase deficiency is an autosomal dominant deficiency that causes hereditary angioedema, whereby the patients present with serious edema of the throat and mouth. Is this condition responsive to epinephrine, antihistamines, or prednisolone. It does not, actually it does not respond to these medications. Treatment of C1 estrase deficiency includes C1 inhibitors concentrates or Kali crane inhibitors. As a last resort, and if the former two compounds are unavailable, fresh frozen plasma may be used for these patients. Note that attenuated androgens are also used for prophylaxis of angioedema as they increase the levels of C1 estrase inhibitors. In contrast, estrogens are shown to decrease the levels of C1 estrase inhibitors most likely through interactions that involves the liver. This brings us to type 2 hypersensitivity. 
Another name for type 2 hypersensitivity is cytotoxic hypersensitivity. Mnemonic, say 2 toxic hypersensitivity. Antibodies produced by the immune response bind to antigens on the patient's own cell surfaces. The antigens may either be intrinsic self-antigens or extrinsic antigens that are adsorbed onto the cells during exposure to certain foreign or infectious antigens. The cells of the body with attached antigens are then recognized by antigen-presenting cells, and they induce a B-cell response and, as a result, antibodies against the foreign antigen. So what antibodies mediate type 2 hypersensitivity? IgG or IgM. And these are the antibodies that target self tissues. What are the three main sources of tissue-specific antibodies in type 2 hypersensitivity? One is Hapton effect. A foreign object, such as drug, can act as an Hapton. It can conjugate to and modify self proteins. This results in activation of T cells and B cells and evokes IgG and IgM antibodies against the host cells. The other theory is molecular mimicry. The pathogen in this case induces a normal response, but the antibodies cross-react with host tissues. Finally, we have the loss of self-tolerance theory or autoimmunity. The adaptive system in this case targets the host tissues. What are some classic examples of type 2 hypersensitivity? Blood transfusion reactions, such as ABO incompatibility, hemolytic disease of the newborn, or RH disease, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, drug-induced hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia, hyperacute graft rejection, myasthenia gravis due to damage to acetylcholine receptors, Good pasture syndrome, Graves' disease, insulin-resistant diabetes, pernicious anemia, rheumatic fever, thrombocytopenic purpura, and Wagner's granulomatosis. Let's look at the antibody functions that are involved in type 2 hypersensitivity. I have included examples and the type of the reactions and they involve the pathogenesis. Transfusion reactions are cytotoxic reactions and they involve anti-ABO, IgM or IgG antibodies. Hemolytic disease of newborn infants is a cytotoxic reaction. It involves anti-RH, IgG, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, Cytotoxic involves antiplatelet autoantibodies, pernicious anemia. Just to know, this condition is non cytotoxic. There is involvement of the antibodies. The antibodies are anti prietal and anti intrinsic factor antibodies. Graves' disease, likewise pernicious anemia, involves anti TSH receptor antibodies. Myasthenia gravis, likewise graves, likewise pernicious anemia, involves anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Growth pastures is cytotoxic. There is anti-type 4 collagen antibodies targeting glomerular basement membrane, but also they target the basement membrane in a lung as well. Rheumatic fever, cytotoxic, IgG antibodies are produced against protein M of the Streptococcus pyogenes, and these antibodies also target the myocytes because myocytes have epitopes that resemble the M protein of the Streptococcus pyogenes. Pemphigus vulgaris, cytotoxic, 
In this condition, we have involvement of anti-desmosome antibodies. So what are the three major antibody functions that are involved in the pathogenesis of various type 2 hypersensitivities? Opsonization that involves IgG and C3B fragment of complement 3. Complement mediated cytotoxicity, phagocytosis of the affected cells in the spleen by macrophages, antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity, and finally, antibody attachments to self proteins that inactivate the receptors or dysregulate normal biological functions. Note that some cases use a combination of the above functions. Let us look at this important and commonly tested concept of all three levels of your examination, and that is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. I'm going to be referring to this diagram while I'm explaining this for you. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, HIT, is a thrombotic disorder caused by IgG antibodies attaching to complexes of platelet factor 4, PF4, and heparin. Note that heparin acts as a haptin, and when it attaches to PF4, it evokes adaptive immune response. Platelet factor 2, PF4, is a cytokine released from alpha granules of activated platelets during platelet aggregation. In contrast to other cytopenic conditions, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, instead of bleeding, is commonly presented with thromboembolism. Heparin PF4 and IgG complexes now bind to low affinity FC receptors of the platelets, and this induces widespread platelet activation and thrombosis and widespread thrombocyte aggregations. Platelet activation also leads to additional PF4 release. Note that 1 in 5,000 hospitalized patients present with HIT, and it starts about 5 to 10 days after initiation of heparin therapy. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is due to increased destruction of platelets and splenic sequestration of coated platelets. So what is the treatment for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? Immediate discontinuation of heparin administration. Note that infusion of platelets must be avoided as they exacerbate thrombosis. Warfarin cannot be used until thrombocytopenia is resolved. Alternative anticoagulants may also be used. Examples are Danaparoid that inhibits factor X and bivalirudine and argyotroban that are direct thrombin inhibitors. Myasthenia gravis is classified as a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. In this condition, IgG autoantibodies against acetylcholine receptors target the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. This happens at the neuromuscular junctions. I want you to name two other type 2 hypersensitivity reactions that involve autoantibodies targeting cells and or receptors. Graves' disease or thyrotoxicosis, in this condition, anti-TSH receptor antibodies cause overproduction of thyroxine and as a result hyperthyroidism. The other condition is pernicious anemia, whereby anti cell antibodies affect intrinsic factor and stomach acid secretions. Penicillin is a well-known cause of immediate type 1 hypersensitivity 
and systemic anaphylactic reaction. However, it also induces hemolytic anemia that is classified as a cytotoxic type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. What is the mechanism of type 2 penicillin hypersensitivity and drug-induced hemolytic anemia? I will be referring to this diagram while I'm explaining this mechanism for you. Normal red blood cells have surface proteins. Penicillin byproducts have hapten properties. They attach to these self proteins on the red cells and produce complexes with antigenic effects. As these cells pass through the secondary lymphoid tissues, their surface antigens are recognized by B cells. Activated B cells now proliferate and produce antibodies in the form of IgM and IgG against the protein drug complexes. Circulating IgG and IgM antibodies now bind to antigens or penicillin protein complexes on the red blood cells and they activate the classic pathway. Classic pathway gets activated, now C1 gets activated, we make C4B, C2B and finally as you can tell we're going to make c 3 B. And of course, after we make the C3B, we're going to activate the MAC complex. And now MAC complex gets activated and it causes degradation of the red blood cells. And this causes hemolysis. Note that type 2 production of IgM and IgG mediated reactions may take up to a few days. This is in contrast with the type 1 and IgE-mediated anaphylactic reactions that we have covered earlier, and those, as we discussed, were immediate and would have taken only up to a few minutes for taking place. What are the important must-know complement-mediated type 2 hypersensitivity reactions? These are important for you to know. Transfusion reactions as a result of ABO incompatibility. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia, AIHA, and drug-induced hemolytic anemia. We just covered the example of penicillins. And immune thrombocytopenia. Erythroblastosis fetalis as a result of RH incompatibility. And also good pastures syndrome that results from interaction of autoantibodies with alveolar and glomerular basement membranes. What are the major pathological and diagnostic findings in type 2 hypersensitivity reactions? These are detection of circulating antibodies against the affected tissues, presence of antibodies, complements, and neutrophils in the tissue biopsies. I want you to note that antibodies and complements are identified with immunofluorescence techniques. I want you to also note that glomerular staining for good pastures reveals smooth and linear anti-glomerular pattern of antibody deposits. Make sure that you read also the chapter on renal pathology because that one explains also the findings that you're going to see in good pastures better for you. Let's talk a little bit more about antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity ADCC. If you recall a little earlier we talked about reactions of the body against helminthic diseases. We talked about IgE, IgA, and eosinophils. And now let us look at this concept from a different angle. And I'm going to be referring to this diagram. Natural killer cells, macrophages, eosinophils, and neutrophils, they express FC receptors on their surfaces. Antibody binding to antigens on the target cells and pathogens that are often too big for phagocytosis exposes 
the FC segments of the antibodies and activates these innate cells, the neutrophils, the natural killers, or eosinophils, as you see in this diagram. Cross-linking of antigen and antibodies now causes release of toxic cytokines from the innate cells. In this diagram, I'm showing release of those toxins from eosinophils and natural killer cells on the target cells. A target cell may very well be a helminthic organism. Most no examples of antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity include graft rejection, defense against helminthes and parasites, and also lysis of tumor cells.